Welcome everyone. This is Pospo and Braincast for Modstay Learning. I know, I know, I still haven't been to the to the barber, but you know, this time I have a really good excuse. And it was only Wednesday night I became a father to the most beautiful, the be most beautiful baby in this vain little world of ours. I know I'm totally biased, but who cares? He's chubby with a beautiful smile and lots of roles to play with, which makes all the farting and crying so worth it. A massive shout out to all the women out there. I really don't know how you do it. So thank you. But last week wasn't only about my son as we welcomed Prof Nadia Mikali all the way from Geneva and discussed all things eating disorders. If you missed the episode, you know what to do. Just log into YouTube for the video or Spotify for the audio. This week though, we leave Switzerland behind and travel overseas to a vast and enormously beautiful country. Canada. We make a stop at Toronto where we find the Vice President of Research and Director of the Campbell Family Mental Health Research Institute. Trust me, he's a busy man. He leads a team of over 150 scientists and approximately 600 research staff. His research is as diverse as his achievements from brain mapping in mental illness to scaling system level initiatives in mental health care. I mean, he has more than 200 papers, right? He's serving on the editorial board of Schizophrenia Bulletin and the co-chair of the Schizophrenia International Research Society 2021 meeting that actually just happened. He's a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto, holds a Canada Research Chair, and serves on the Scientific Council of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Now, why am I saying all that? Because I'm trying to convince you that my decision to invite him was totally unbiased and not influenced whatsoever by his first name, and who would have thought? His Greek roots. No, don't worry. He has a proper accent. Braincast people, this is Professor Aristotel Voinescos. Welcome. Thank you, Pospo. What an introduction. What an introduction. So, Prof, welcome to Braincast. Before we go all nerdy and scientific, let's start with the basics. So what do we mean by the word cognition? Because it's certainly way more than just memory, right? Yes. Um, it can be anything from your sensor and motor function all the way out to your executive function. And there's a number of different cognitive domains. Uh, you know, these, those are a couple of them. For example, your processing speed, um, different types of memory. You mentioned memory, but it can be your visuospatial memory, your verbal memory. And there's a whole other area that's known as social cognition, which I, I'm personally quite excited by, uh, which is really our ability to re recognize emotions, but also... Uh, detect things like humor, which we just saw uh, on display, <laughs> lies and sarcasm. <laughs> Fantastic. And, you know, while cognitive neuroscience may have originated, you know, back in the days when, you know, Pierre Paul Broca observed that patients with left hemisphere brain damage suffered language problems, we've traveled a long way. And one thing that essentially revolutionized neurosciences is, is neuroimaging. So, how has taking pictures of the brain changed throughout the years? Yeah, there's a number of levels at which things have changed. So the technology's improved over time. So the field strength of the MRI magnets has improved. So the resolution that we have has improved substantially. Um, you know, there's a number of different academic centers that are all the way up to seven Tesla MRI now. So you can basically see, uh, you know, if you dissected a postmortem brain in your hand, you can basically see the living brain at that resolution now, which is extremely impressive. Wow. Um, and then, of course, a number of methodologies that have uh, come to better analyze the brain once you take a picture of the brain have allowed us to interrogate the brain and understand the brain in ways that we we didn't think about before. And, and that's, I think, primarily changed our, our brain from a, a conceptualization of a, a set of regions or, or places uh, to a set of interacting networks. And what are, in your opinion, you know, the key insights neuroimaging allowed into the neurobiology of cognition? You can choose two because I just feel generous with time today. Well, I, I'll choose two related pieces that that I think okay. kick off from, the, from my my prior response. So, 
again, that initially people were quite focused on, let's say, the hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. So they might have done an imaging study to analyze the structure of the hippocampus or analyze the um, bold, uh, the bold signal in the hippocampus or the blood flow in the hippocampus, for example. Uh, but now we've um, really started to understand that a task like memory might relate to how the frontal cortex couples with the hippocampus, right? But then the second step in, in this sort of two-step answer is that that's not necessarily true for everyone. Other people's memory wow. may work in different ways. Uh, they may That may not be um, the only network they use. They may have compensatory networks or other networks for various reasons. Um, and so I think a, a critical piece of learning that that has come up over the past few years is that we have uh, diverse ways of handling cognition in our brain. Fantastic. So, Aristotle, let's get down to business. So, schizophrenia, although you know most usually known for delusions and hallucinations as prevailing features, it's in fact the cognitive deficits that strongly predict social and functional outcomes. And I know you can be you know talking about this for days, but can you summarize the main cognitive deficits one can find in schizophrenia? So, you know, we're going to talk about people with schizophrenia as a group, which I'm yep. reluctant to do because it, it, I'm going to, you know, I, I, yes. I'd like to get back to the, the notion of people as individuals because everybody's different, including people with schizophrenia. They're, they can be as different from each other as, as from anyone who does not have schizophrenia in terms of how their brain works or their cognitive uh, status. But on average, people with schizophrenia do have impairments pretty well in every cognitive domain. Mm. But the effect sizes, if you, you know, in meta-analytic studies do suggest that um, working memory performance uh, is probably the cognitive domain that is most impacted on average compared to people who do not have schizophrenia. Uh, some neurocognitive <laughs> neurocognitive scientists may disagree with me. People have hot <laughs> opinions about this, but um, but I, I would say in in what we call cold cognition, which is just the the standard cognition, so not talking about social cognition, people would probably say it's working memory performance. Okay, and, and and to be honest, inspired, if you like, by these cognitive deficits, it was as early as 2008, and even maybe earlier, that Kirkpatrick asked to the question, is schizophrenia a syndrome of accelerated aging? And some 11 years later, in 2019, your team with Sabah Shahab gave, I think, the answer in a neuropsychopharmacology paper. So t tell me more. So I'm reluctant to say we ever gave the answer, but... <laughs> We found, we had some findings, Pospo, we had some findings. Aristotle, just give us your Aristotle, you have answers to everything. So, you know, and 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 you would know this as a, as a neuropsychiatrist, but, you know, Kreplin called this illness dementia praecox for a reason. So, um, you know, his, the, the you know, the terminology there can be interpreted as, a, as an early dementia, an early cognitive disorder. And really what we found um, in studying people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder across the adult lifespan, so from the first episode until late life. And I think that was a, a fun part of the research that I've had the chance to do in Toronto, where we've even studied geriatric patients who have bipolar and schizophrenia and learned a lot. It's, you know, it's an understudied group. Um, we found that the deficits that were present were present right from the first episode. And the magnitude of the deficits did not increase in size. And if anything, um, in late life, decreased in size. Now, I want to uh, put the big caveat that this is a cross-sectional study. Um, you know, I <laughs> we, we didn't follow people for 60 years. So that's also important. So we're not following the same patients. So when you do cross-sectional research, for, for, for those of you who enjoy lifespan research like I do, that, that's an important caveat because you can have cohort effects. Um, but nevertheless, instead of seeing accelerated aging over time, we think that there's really an early hit that's already present by the first episode of illness. That's really, that's really interesting. And, and, and while Aristotle, you know, dry neuroimaging findings may not really mean much to the initiated, if you like, it is when we link these with clinical measures that starts making more sense. And one such measure is IQ. In a recent meta-analysis for the American Journal of Psychiatry, Lorena Holleran included 760 patients with schizophrenia and nearly like 1,000 controls. Now, the group found that cognitive ability is associated with global structural connectivity and that more efficient white matter microstructure is 
essentially associated with higher IQ. Now, without underestimating you know, the massive love, passion and efforts that went into the making of that paper, isn't that, I don't know, a bit generic? I was expecting to hear a bit more you know, specific, if you like, you know, tract related action. So, so what do you think? It is generic. Um, it's a good pl it's a good starting point in a sense. Um, you know, when when you have that kind of a sample size, I think you can feel a bit more confident in your findings. The effect sizes are not large; they're they're relatively small. Um, I think what's important about that study is that um, it's just important to remember, I guess, that that within each of our brains, our white matter is correlated. Uh, so the different measures they used to it's a kind of a ballpark statement or a loose statement, but 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 white matter integrity, basically the integrity of the white matter tracks with different metrics. You know, irrespective of where you're measuring your brain, if it's high in one part of your brain, if you're a person where it's it's more likely statistically to be high in another part. And same thing with your cognitive performance. If you have strong executive function, on average, you're more likely to have, you know, better episodic memory performance, for instance. So th these global measures of IQ and white matter um that that you know kind of better iq which is basically a composite measure and better white matter across the brain another composite measure being correlated isn't terribly surprising i think where things get more interesting because i think maybe maybe part of where you're coming from pospo is uh using my theory of mind and social cognition is <laughs> is that you know it's it's not terribly fascinating you know it, it doesn't feel like you know a significant advance in some sort of way and i think that um uh, you know, it does get more interesting when we start looking at uh, specific tracks or specific networks within the brain. Um, but that, again, takes us back to the fact that when you're looking at the whole population, you're just going to pick up a small signal because the reality is going to be among those 700 patients with schizophrenia or 700 controls, they're going to have different white matter strengths or cognitive strengths as subgroups of people, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of heterogeneity among people with schizophrenia or, or among people who are healthy as well. So we just had a paper accepted at JAMA Psychiatry led by the unstoppable Kate Merritt, which essentially is a mega analysis of glutamatergic abnormalities in psychosis. 1,200 okay. patients and say, thank you very much. I didn't do much, to be honest. Kate did the whole work. So certainly oversimplifying, but too much glutamate, too bad for your psychosis. Now, the good news is that, you know, nowadays we are able to combine, you know, functional MRI, and MRS spectroscopy, you know, in just one scan. So do you think that the findings align? So fMRI and MRS, do they make sense if you put them together? So I, I'm, I'm not much of an MRS expert who kind of lately come into getting a little bit interested in MRS, but certainly not an area I've done a lot of work in. But a, a colleague and collaborator, Adrian Lati at the University of Alabama at Birmingham has published a number of uh, MRS papers in people with schizophrenia first episode. And they've had a couple of interesting papers over the past uh, year or two suggesting that one of the MRS signals is correlated with functional connectivity in the default mode network, for example, uh, in people with schizophrenia. And possibly even those two signals together have uh, um, some kind of relationship between you know, predictive ability in terms of people who respond to treatment or who do not respond to treatment, might be treatment resistant, let's say I need clozapine. So, you know, that's a superficial answer more because it's not exactly my area, but I, I think that congratulations one, and I think, you know, Adrian and her team too are, are starting to show some really neat relationships there because if you can get at the neurochemical abnormalities of these functional connectivity changes, I think there's some useful uh, clinical information there in terms of psychopharmacological decisions that you can make. Mm. And, you know, a little talked about, you know, element of psychosis that may have far greater impact on someone's life but also how we end up treating our patients is insight for example you know I hardly ever treat patients with parkinson's psychosis if they retain insight in their symptoms i know it's different but still relevant now a couple of years ago you published an extremely interesting paper in nature schizophrenia talking about disrupted posterior corpus callosal white matter in integrity so is that a common finding about insight across disorders or is it specific to schizophrenia but most importantly how are we expected as clinicians to use this info i mean you know imagine being able to modulate networks and reinstate insight it will transform the care of our patients as i do feel it will lead to significant let's say for example reduction of detentions so, so what do you think 
A great question, Possible. And, and a really, you know, insight's becoming a very hot topic in social psychiatry and, and in services research where you know, there's a lot of strong opinions <clears throat> to your point about not just involuntary detention, but also, you know, involuntary treatment when someone's not necessarily capable even to make treatment decisions. And we, we decide to use medication through a substitute decision maker to help them uh, get better. In some cases, not actually. Some people can still remain very sick, unfortunately. Uh, so that work was led by Phil Gerritsen. It's really, you know, his work at Dr. Phil Gerritsen in Toronto at, at my hospital. Um, but yes, I think, you know, Phil's interest in that part of the brain was stimulated by, you know, lesion studies and the, the whole notion of anosognosia, you know, um, you know, the ancient Greek word for, for yes, yes, lack, lack of, uh, you know, insight or basically lack of illness awareness, to put it more, to, to translate it more directly. And um, uh, that's, that's, that is a, a, a region or a, a part of the brain that is relevant for insight across the board. It's not just uh, a region that's, let's say, relevant for insight in schizophrenia, number one. And number two, possibly, I think your, your point regarding network modulation is exactly on target. So Phil and his team are currently conducting uh, a clinical trial using neurostimulation to try and modulate uh, that network to determine whether it can A, improve insight and B, also improve medication adherence in people with uh, schizophrenia, where we know that that it is an issue that's tightly interwoven with insight. Amazing. I mean, you, you know, you know what I really like about your research is that most times, you know, you you take that leap of faith and go all out in your interpretation of the results, making them, I have to say, way more clinically meaningful. But let's see what I mean. In a, I think it was 2020 paper for biological psychiatry, CNNI, you studied the social cognitive networks and the social cognitive performance in people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders using an fMRI paradigm. Now, what I found really interesting is the way that you use neuroimaging to essentially challenge the current diagnostic criteria. And you conclude that, in fact, functional connectivity differences were associated with social cognitive performance, but not with diagnostic group. So, so can you tell me a bit more, but most importantly, what do you think are the implications of such a statement? Right, and, and that, that also extends on a paper in 2019 by Colin Hocko that we published in the American Journal, uh, where we used the other fMRI task in that, in that study. And again, through a, a top-down, a hierarchical clustering, like a, a data-driven analysis, found three different patterns of functional brain activation that were not related to diagnostic group, but that were related to cognitive performance. Um, mm. So that was, so the, the CNNI paper was the second task. So we had a task where people would imitate and observe emotional faces. That was the American Journal paper. And the second one was an empathic accuracy task where people would actually watch actors uh, tell stories uh, that had emotion in them and they'd rate what the emotions they thought the actors were feeling. So more of a perspective taking social cognition task. And in both studies, what we found is that brain network activation was associated with social cognition outside of the scanner. We had a, a battery outside of the scanner, but was not associated with, with diagnosis. That doesn't mean that people with schizophrenia on average don't have more impaired social cognition. They do. But the brain patterns that we found that were related to social cognitive performance had nothing to do with diagnosis. These two papers came out of a, a three-center, multi-center grant funded by the NIMH. Uh, the acronym, you always have to have a good acronym for your grants, was SPINS, the Social <laughs> Processes Initiative in Neurobiology of the Schizophrenia. And this was actually an RDOC study. It was one of the first RDOC or research domain criteria studies funded by the NIMH. And it, it might surprise people to hear that it just had people with different schizophrenia spectrum disorders and healthy controls, but the point of RDOC was really to recruit people with a wide range of behavioral performance and a putatively wide range of neural circuit function. We wanted to get people who have very different abilities in the study because we thought that the heterogeneity would allow us to start to tease apart different groups of people and how people use different parts of their brain to perform the same cognitive tasks, right? So, so you or I possibly well, may get a scanner and we may do the same task differently, right? And that's what's fascinating to me because it has treatment implications. So if you want to now target, we just talked about modulating insight networks. If, you know, people with schizophrenia, you know, it would be amazing if we could, and we have a trial going on right now to target their dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and modulate the social cognitive network. But we have to come up with more individualized approaches for that targeting because not everybody is going to use their network in the same way. Amazing, amazing. Uh, wow.
from diagnosis to treatment, although I really want to talk more about it, but, you know, we need to move on. So while we keep on saying that, you know, cognitive deficits are part and parcel of schizophrenia, we're not doing really much about it, are we? I mean, in fact, sometimes we end up making things even worse, given that over 50% of individuals with schizophrenia have comorbidities that require anticholinergic medications, and clinically, this may affect cognition, as showed, in fact, in a schizophrenia bulletin paper by Wakas Ulakan last year. And on a similar note, you published a JAMA psychiatry paper last year suggesting that olanzapine is not that great for your brain's cortical thickness. Now, the million-dollar question, is it then worth taking it? I'm definitely going to answer that question in a second possible. I want to credit all of the people doing cognitive remediation trials for, for cognition because we've been talking about modulation. And I think those are probably the two most valuable areas. I think psycho, psychotropic approaches have not been terribly successful, but we are seeing some interesting effect sizes with there. So I'm going to just jump back because I know, you know, people like, uh, there's there's a number of people out there that I want to make sure, you know, get, get, get deserved credit for all of their research to enhance cognition and, and improve the deficits. So, Depends. It depends what I take olanzapine. So the, the the paper that we published was in people with psychotic depression, and they were uh, remitted when we scanned them. So the 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 paper before that paper was a paper that we published in JAMA, which is a clinical trial. Psychotic depression is a really understudied illness, the very severe. For those of you who've who've helped people with psychotic depression, people get hospitalized, highly suicidal, high rates of completed suicide. Um, it's a really difficult situation, and in that paper, we showed that olanzapine plus sertraline was superior to sertraline alone for preventing relapse. So the people were treated when they were sick. They were randomized at 20 weeks to continue on olanzapine and sertraline because that's how they were treated to get better, or to come off olanzapine and continue treatment on sertraline with placebo, sertraline being an antidepressant, because there was no clinical trial that had yet assessed whether once someone gets better from the psychotic depression, should they stay on an antipsychotic or not. Olanzapine plus sertraline was far better than sertraline alone at preventing relapse. So clinically, when faced with an illness this severe and you know someone will stay well, uh, that's a really huge part of the story. So before we get to the neuroimaging, it's really important to understand the clinical situation. However, in the sertraline plus placebo group, only about half of the people relapsed. So it suggests that there are some people who don't necessarily need an antipsychotic to stay well. We know that if you get an antipsychotic, you're very likely to stay well over time. But there are gonna be some people who don't need one. And that's mm -hmm. where things like imaging, the metabolic side effects, and, and other assessments come into play because really when you make a clinical decision, you wanna strike the right balance between the benefits and risks of a treatment decision. So with their imaging, what we found was that olanzapine was associated with a reduction in cortical thickness. However, in the people who relapsed on placebo, they also experienced a reduction in the cortical thickness. So it's sort of a wash in a sense, because yes, if you're likely to stay well, right, perhaps you, know, you don't also want the metabolic burden of olanzapine and a bit of a reduction in cortical thickness. There's no you know, there's no clear clinical issue with that small reduction cortical thickness, but generally speaking, we interpret, most of us would want to keep all of our cortical thickness. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, if, if you're getting psychotic, if you're, if you're getting sick, you know, that, that can be a lethal illness. People commit suicide, they get hospitalized. So, so our, our advice, I guess, at the end of the paper was, in the presence of psychosis, you always use an antipsychotic. But where alternatives are present, let's say like, unipolar depression where now antipsychotics are actually approved for someone with common depression or a behavioral problem for a kid with ADHD you may want to you know reconsider the risks and benefits there enough with psychosis let's okay. talk about the inevitability of time aging so you were recently part of a massive study looking into subcortical volumes and cortical thickness across lifespan including data from 18,000 people so what did you see there and how do you think it relates to cognition I'll, I'll try and keep this answer brief uh, because my prior answer was long so so and and I you know I was like a you know these this is the enigma consortium they deserve the credit we really uh, gave them our data as as many other sites did to make these kinds of studies possible which are important for the field I think I'll, I'll cut to the chase for both the answer and one question you know what I thought was really interesting is that um 
as, as people get older, there's increased variability, going, going back to this theme that we've been talking about. And so when people get older with subcortical structures, there's more variability in their hippocampal and amygdala volume. And there's more variability in their frontal and temporal cortical thickness. And there's more variability in their lateral ventricle volume. And I think what that's really uh, uh, you know, identifying are these different trajectories late in the lifespan, right? For people to stay cognitively healthy and age well versus having risk for dementia. And I love this idea of variability because, again, it goes away from is your hippocampus bigger or smaller, which may not matter if you have a frontal cortex that compensates for it. So, so I think that was those were neat common findings from those two studies. And, and you know there has been a really notable interest in the prodromal phases of neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, where in fact, psychiatric symptoms can be invariably present. So depression, for example, is a risk factor for the progression from normal cognition to mild cognitive impairment and from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. And given that whether we like it or not, we're not anywhere near an effective medication for Alzheimer's, maybe, maybe, I'm just saying the key lies in prevention. So is there any evidence from neuroimaging that actually links the two, depression and Alzheimer's? Absolutely, there is actually. So first, as you noted, so epidemiologically, depression of itself is a risk factor for dementia. People may not be so aware of this. The odds ratio is two. So not huge, but not tiny. I think where it gets very interesting is what kind of depression? And what we've started to find, so firstly, if you look at the brain networks of depression, let's say Alzheimer's dementia, they're very similar. You have, uh, and especially with late life depression, so you have the frontal executive pathway, so the, the, almost the theory of vascular depression that George Alexopoulos and David Steffens came up with. And then you also have the cortical limbic uh, circuit, right, which is important for memory function and is relevant both in, in emotion processing, both for depression and dementia. So you have overlapping circuits and you have overlapping cognitive domains. We published a paper showing that was the sort of from baseline data from a clinical trial where we're trying to treat uh, or at least uh, preserve cognitive function in, in older people who uh, have recovered from depression. We actually interestingly found that people who recovered from depression, their brains were no different than people who don't, don't have depression or are healthy. To us, that's indirect evidence that perhaps successful treatment of this known risk factor might be preventative in and of itself. So to me, it, it flips prevention a bit on its head because rather than trying to treat the early stages of dementia, if you can treat that antecedent risk factor, maybe you're preserving the brain. And we have a, a, a five-site grant that we're in the middle of right now that's actually following very ill people with depression, treatment-resistant depression across five centers, specifically uh, aiming to look at their brain structure function and their cognitive performance over a couple of years and see who is at highest risk of cognitive decline in dementia. Because our hypothesis is those people who have depression that cannot be successfully treated, who stay unwell, are going to be the people who have the greatest decline in brain structure function and cognitive performance. And, and what do you do with that? I mean, how can your imaging help decide what intervention yeah. would best suit an individual? Well, I think at a public health level, if you could show that by successfully treating depression, you preserve the brain and, and you, you uh, don't let the brain deteriorate into a dementia pathway, there are many people with untreated depression who will get better. So number one, you might, it might encourage many people to seek treatment and it may actually destigmatize depression a bit because depression still feels like this nebulous thing. People seem to understand dementia a bit better. So there's a whole group of people who might benefit, who aren't benefiting right now. And then I think it would accelerate our interests and in, you know, all the billions of dollars that are being spent, let's say to fight amyloid, instead perhaps to move up the pathway and also focus on depression, not necessarily just drug-based treatment, but as you, as you heard, we're, we're, you know, we have this brain stimulation study. There's many psychosocial interventions that can treat depression again. So I think there's a lot of other, other ways to handle the, to try and tackle the problem. Amazing. I mean, to be, to be honest, you know, it seems, it seems surreal to be doubting Aristotle, but, you know, there's always something to be gained, you know, with, with uh, devil's advocate time. So, Aristotle, we live in the era of personalized medicine and precision psychiatry, but the truth is that, and I quote an older paper by Evan Gordon, that human functional MRI research primarily focuses on analyzing data averaged across groups which in fact limits 
the detail, the specificity, and clinical utility, if you like, of fMRI. Because as we know, you know, groups are hardly ever homogeneous. So how do we move past that point? Or to use a title from your recent paper on neuroimage, so how do we move beyond the mean? And I think we've been we've been talking about this indirectly possible for this whole interview that that people don't Did use. <laughs> and so we're almost done. We're almost done. So um, you know, the good news is people are already doing this. Um, so there's a number of groups, including ours, that have become very interested not just in in subgroups, which we've already talked about, but in individually uh, uh, assessing people's brain functional connectivity. So Erin Dickey in our group, for example, is a scientist. She's developed a, a method called personalized intrinsic network topography, or PINT. I noticed on Twitter that you went for a PINT. <laughs> I'm four days already. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so the notion here being, and the way she's done this, and you know, and Evan Gordon and others have also been doing this, is they've moved their analysis to the surface of the cortex. So it's a, it's a methodological decision they made, uh, rather than um, you know analyzing functional nodes in the brain as spheres as volumes, they've they've moved it to the cortical surface. So it's a methodological piece, and then Erin optimizes her assessment. Because each of our, so let's take our working memory network. I'm gonna try and concretize it for a bit, right? So you have your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay? So, so your peak point of functional connectivity in your DLPFC will probably be in a slightly different spot than mine. Just, just by, by, by the way our cortex is folding and the way the function. So by, if we use the average of the population, we'd be leaving data on the table, right? Mm -hmm. So when you optimize those functional connectivity networks at the individual level, some people argue it's as sophisticated almost as a fingerprint. There's some nice work by Emily Finn suggesting this, but at minimum, what it allows us to do is probably uh, enhance our ability to detect associations of behavior, which is where we started the conversation to today, but also when it comes to targeting, and we've talked about um, brain stimulation targeting, you know, again, when, you, when you're targeting with neuromodulation, Historically, people have used an average spot, but you know, imagine doing uh, cardiovascular surgery possible and being off by half a centimeter, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be good. So, so in the same way, right? So you know, all, all of us are going to have that kind of variability. So we may be entirely missing someone's depression target or memory target in the brain if we use a group average. And this is exactly the reason I didn't become a neurosurgeon, because for me, half a centimeter, one centimeter is all the same. And, you know, you know, Aristotle, truth is that for some people, this, you know, neuroimaging business may be all too fancy without real life value, if you like. But, you know, reading through your commentary on how childhood trauma maps onto brain systems and behavior, I feel that neuroimaging is on the right path. As you say that, you know, these findings make more clear the importance of addressing social determinants of health and our collective responsibility in creating societies where physical abuse, sexual abuse and severe neglect are identified early or even prevented rather than attempting to treat their consequences in tertiary care centers. This is not my words, this is your words. So. So Aristotle, so what does the future hold for neuroimaging and cognition? And you have 32, 33 seconds maximum. We're already out of time. Oh boy, I wasn't prepared for this one. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, possible. My, my goal really as a clinician is that it should be another tool in the clinic. I don't think that the fanciness as you described should really be replacing the importance of the interview of clinical observation. But wouldn't it be helpful? As for example, uh, Nikos Kutsalera showed that in prodromal patients, for example, there are about 30% for whom clinicians are terrible at predicting outcome, but that the inclusion of imaging data into an algorithm helped better predict functioning, which in turn helps better allocate service, precious service delivery resources. So my hope is that it just becomes one of the tools in our toolbox moving forward, both modest and aspirational at the same time. Breakest people, Professor Aristotle Voinescos, genuinely, genuinely unparalleled work. And from one genius to another, we're leaving the busy streets of Toronto and return to London to meet the winner of one of the most prestigious awards in science, the Brain Prize for 2021, Professor Peter Godsby. And what did he win it for? Oh, stop being a headache. And this is exactly what we will be talking about, headaches. But until then, Pospo and Braincast for Mozart Learning, over and out, time to feed my baby. <laughs>